Today we're going to be taking a look at performance in Godot. So I made a super simple project to help and this is what it looks like. This just spawns a hundred rectangles, I've called them agents, and each agent moves in a random direction and bounces off the walls. By the way, if you want to see the scene tree for the game that's currently running, you can do that by going to the remote tab within the scene tree panel. If, like me, you don't have a second monitor, then if you have Microsoft Power Toys installed, you can press Control Windows T to keep the game window on top of the editor. Now I can freely browse the scene tree over here while also getting a good view of the game. So you can see we've got 100 characters, four walls, a camera, and that's about it. But the question is, how do we go about profiling this? How can we get some idea of how fast our game is running so that we can make informed decisions about any optimizations that we want to make? I'll just briefly show you the scripts that we're working with here. My main script, which is attached to the level root, uses a world bounds object, which is just a rectangle, to establish valid spawn points for our agents. Then we go ahead and spawn agents. This is just doing a little bit of maths to make sure that we're not gonna spawn them inside the outer wall. And then this loop just spawns all the agents that we need with random positions. Our agent is a character body 2D. It has a collision shape and it has a polygon, which is currently white. And if you're interested, the agent exists on the player collision layer, but only collides with walls. If we wanted the agents to collide with each other, then we could do something like this, but I'm gonna keep that turned off for now just to keep things really, really simple. Our agents move in a random direction initially, based on some speed, and then in the physics process function, they're just moving according to their current velocity, and if they collided, they will just bounce off whatever surface they hit. So before we do anything else with this, let's just get some idea of the current performance. Thankfully, Godot's documentation is excellent as always. So I gather we need to use the profiler, which is in the debugger tab. If we tick auto start, then it should start immediately when we run our game. And that's gonna to start to capture some data about how long every frame is taking. That'll do. So once it's run for a bit, I'm gonna hit stop and we can then zoom right in to see exactly what's going on on a frame by frame basis. So what are we actually looking at here? This red line at the top is our physics frame time. That's just a frame of reference which tells us how long is between each physics update. By default, this is about 16 milliseconds, which corresponds to 60 frames per second. But this can be changed in the project settings. So you can see that most of these frames were about halfway up to the red line. And that's because on the left, we can see that the frame time was about eight milliseconds, which is half of our budget. But we do have some longer frames, such as this one, which took 13 milliseconds. And if we want to drill down a little bit deeper, we can see that the bulk of that was the process time, not the physics time. In our case, since we've not overridden any process methods, this is probably something happening internally in the engine itself. So I don't think there's much we can do about it. We can also view that as a percentage. So the process time in this case took 93% of the frame. What's interesting to see is that every other frame, the physics time drops to zero. And I expect that's because I'm rendering at 120 Hertz, which is twice the frame rate of the physics. So the physics is actually only running every other frame. Since my code is so simple, there aren't a lot of GDScript function calls listed here, but this could be used in a more complex program to see which functions are taking longer to run. For some reason, when I did tick a GDScript function, my graph disappeared. I'm not exactly sure why this happened, but nonetheless, we do get some useful information here. For example, we can see that 5.8% of the frame time was spent in agent.physics process. That was called 100 times, which is what we'd expect and 4.1% of the frame time was spent in Godot's 2D physics system. Now, to make things a little bit more interesting, I wanted to introduce a raycast. Whenever we change our velocity, we're gonna point the raycast in the direction of travel, and we're gonna color our polygon based on whether that raycast has hit a wall or not. So hopefully this is gonna look a little bit like Christmas. There we go, that's working nicely. So any agent that's about to hit the wall will turn red and everything else is gonna be green. And if we do a bit of profiling on that, 
we can see that even with 500 agents, it's not too crazy. The physics time is about, let's say nine milliseconds on average. But what if we didn't want to perform a raycast every single frame? What if we only wanted to perform a raycast, let's say every 100 milliseconds or 0.1 seconds? This simple cooldown means that we only check the result of the raycast periodically, but we're still using a raycast 2D node, which by nature performs a raycast every frame. So how could we improve this? Well, in the last video, I showed how you can fire a raycast on demand, but it turns out there's an even easier way. If we disable the raycast, then it will no longer perform a raycast every frame, and we can just call force raycast update whenever we want to get an updated result. Let's see what happens in the profiler now. So as expected, we're now getting these spikes every 100 milliseconds because all of our 500 agents are firing their raycasts at the same time. So our physics time is somewhere in the region of five milliseconds, and then we hit a spike, and suddenly it goes up to about double that. This is a little bit concerning because if these spikes get too big, that could cause some noticeable lag. Fortunately, there is an easy solution. If we randomize the initial cooldown on these rays, then they should fire at slightly different times, which will divide the load between more frames. So let's give this a go. Now you can see that the frame times on average are much, much lower because we're only performing raycasts every 100 milliseconds and we're spreading out those raycasts over multiple frames between all of our agents. Now you might be wondering, is it better to perform a raycast programmatically like I showed in my last video or use a raycast 2D node with this force raycast update function? And at the risk of sounding like ChatGPT, the answer is a little bit nuanced. My understanding is that the Raycast 2D node is a little bit faster on the basis that it's implemented directly in the engine. Whereas if we perform a Raycast programmatically like we did in my last video, there's a little bit of overhead in going from the GD script layer to the engine layer. However, I did do some tests with the profiler and honestly, with 500 agents doing Raycasts every frame, the difference was negligible. I think at best, the Raycast 2D node saved about one millisecond on average. In general, my advice would be do what makes sense for your use case and try not to worry about micro performance optimizations unless and until you have a performance bottleneck. There's a famous saying that premature optimization is the root of all evil. And while that might sound a bit extreme, I think the principle is sound. I think it's always better to start by making your code as readable and intuitive as possible and that makes it much easier to address bugs and performance concerns later down the line. Okay, so that was the Profiler tab, but there are a few other interesting tabs that we can look at as well. The Visual Profiler tab is concerned with how long the game takes to render, and this is divided into CPU on the left and GPU on the right. So if we have a performance bottleneck, we can identify exactly what's causing it. Again, because this project is very simple, there's not a lot of information here, but this view on the left shows us everything that happens when we render a frame. And if we stop capturing, we can view the data on a frame by frame basis. At the moment, the graph is all quite bunched up at the bottom. That's because we're well below the target frame time, which is being shown at the top here. So if we want to get a better view of this data, we can untick fit to frame which will give us a slightly closer look at the graph. The next tab is monitors. And this just tells us a lot of different metrics about the game that's running, which you can plot on a graph over time. Here we can see how long it's taking to process each frame and we can see the physics time as well. What's nice about this tab is it's actually very easy to add custom metrics. So for example, if the number of agents in our project varied over time, it would be very easy to add a new metric to this screen so that we can easily track how the number of agents changes. In fact, I'll show you what that looks like. So in our process method on our main node, we now have a random chance to spawn a new agent. Then all we need to do is call performance.addCustomMonitor. We provide a name for our new metric, such as agents, and we provide a function which gets called to evaluate this metric. For example, get num agents. We'll define this function down the bottom. And since we're adding our agents to an array, we can just call agents.size. Let's see if that's worked. 
So in our monitors, we can now see under custom, we have 513 agents and growing. So we started with 500 and it's randomly adding them during gameplay. By default, any monitors that you add appear under this custom category, but you can also supply your own category name followed by a slash. The final tab that we're gonna look at today is this video RAM tab. And this is used to keep track of all the resources that are taking up memory on the GPU. Presumably most of these are built in because our game doesn't actually use any textures right now, but it's possible that these are icons or fonts. And our render targets here are what's being used to render the game to the viewport. And finally, in the top right, you can see the total amount of memory being used. So that's all for today, but if you like this sort of content, make sure you subscribe to see more, and let me know in the comments if there's anything else you want me to cover.